This is CNN Breaking News. And at 44 minutes after the hour, breaking news to tell you about, according to the Associated Press, that big day of morning rally in Tehran has begun. Information today, a precious commodity there as the Iranian regime cracks down on the uh, release of information, severely limiting our ability to report there. But according to the Associated Press, that demonstration has begun today. That's right. So uh, information is, is still getting out. It is just harder to come by. And uh, this, again, is because, as we've been talking about, the crackdown on protesters and also the media. People in Iran, though, have turned to Facebook, to Twitter, to texting to get the word out about what's going on. And CNN has been monitoring these social media sites to try to keep you informed. So here's what some people have been tweeting about in Iran about the unrest. Here's one. March uh, is in uh, the march is in memory of those killed by government. Musavi will lead Sea of Green. Uh, this is referring to what we just talked about being underway right now. This march to honor those who were killed in some fighting with the pro-government militia earlier in the week. Another uh, tweet. My mom didn't let me tweet anything for three hours. She's so worried about me. Don't know what to do. She's afraid of Iran's intelligence agency. And another, Gov spreading false rumors on Twitter that protesters are causing violence. This is not true. Now, joining us for a closer look at the social media phenomenon in Iran is Nicholas Thompson. He's a senior editor at Wired Magazine. Thanks for sticking around this morning to talk to us, Nick. Um, first of all, are we overstating the role of social networking in organizing these rallies in Iran? I think we're overstating the role of Twitter. I don't think we're necessarily overstating the role of cell phones, Facebook, or social networking in general. So what is Twitter being used for in Iran? Twitter is being used for some internal communications. What it's really being used for is getting the word out to the outside world. The great thing about Twitter is that you can have as many followers as you want and anybody can read anything. So it's a completely open network. So it's great if you want to get news to your friends in America, or people in the media in America who are watching and who are you know, playing an important role in this, in this drama. But if you actually want to organize a protest, and if you actually want to get people together at 6 o'clock, Twitter is kind of sort of useful, but it's not being used by everybody in Iran the way that it's sometimes portrayed as here in the United States. So you say that this notion of a Twitter revolution is not quite uh, painting the... Uh, well, it's accurate. not quite a revolution yet, right. and it's not quite Twitter. So it's... Yes, Twitter is a great tool. It's very useful, and it, you know, there are a lot of advantages to it, and there are a lot of reasons why some people are using it, like these tweets that we just saw, but we shouldn't get too excited about Twitter itself right now. Let's talk about, in general, uh, the ability of the uh, Iranian government, if it chooses to do so, to shut down these sites. How effective is trying to limit Internet communication? It's, it's fairly effective. Now, with Twitter, what you can do is they can shut down the website, Twitter.com, and they can do that easily. They control the pipes. They can just say, no more Twitter.com. But a lot of people use Twitter through other services. Or tweets go out and they're sort of filtered. You can tweet through Facebook, right? I can put something on TweetDeck and it will automatically go to my Facebook friends. Now, that's using Twitter, but if you shut down Twitter.com, that doesn't do anything to it. So there are ways around it. But the other thing to remember is that there aren't that many people who really know how to use Twitter in Iran right now. I mean, there are plenty, but not not enough to organize a million people in the streets or hundreds of thousands of people in the street. So, yes, some of them can get around it, but it's a percentage of a small percentage that's using it in the beginning. So the other interesting thing is, as you said, finding ways to get around uh, the, the slowing down or in some cases the total cutoff of the Internet. Yeah. What are some of the ways that information is still being able to come in and to go out? of Iran? Well, you can use, I mean, cell phones are great. You, you, it's very hard to actually cut down the entire cell phone network, and if you do that, then the, um, you know, the pro-government forces can't communicate either. So uh, you can use other social networking services. You can go, as I said, you can go through TweetDeck. There are about 10 applications that you can use. You can also um, filter your, um, you can also use a browser. You can use a safe mode in your browser. There's software called Tor, T-O-R, and that prevents you from being followed or watched. So the ways you can anonymize your blogging, if you use the Google Chrome browser or if you use the new Firefox 3.5 browsers, there are ways to set those up so that nobody can track you and you can be anonymous and you can post what you want. That's very fascinating. Speaking of being anonymous and blogging, uh, we wanted to talk to you about this as well. Um, this court ruling dealing with blogger privacy, this was in the UK. A judge ruled Tuesday that the identity of a police officer who was blogging anonymously about some of the cases that he worked on uh, could be revealed, meaning yeah. he did not, it, he could not have a reasonable expectation to privacy in the blogosphere because yeah. of the whole public nature of the blogosphere. Is that case, they're calling it a landmark case, they're going to change the way that some information and at times rumors and uh, libel 
come out over the internet? I don't think it's a landmark case. I think it's interesting and I think it's important. But what we have to remember here is it wasn't as though the government said, tell us who this blogger is. And then the court said, okay, you have to tell him. What happened here was a newspaper was going to publish this guy's name. He said, hey, I'd like an injunction against my name being published. And the court said, you don't have a right to that injunction. So it's not quite the same as forcing his name out into the public. But any time an anonymous blogger who's possibly blogging to try to keep people in line and put out information he couldn't do if attached to his name, any time someone like that is exposed, it has a chilling effect. And there are some benefits. If everybody had to reveal their name when they blog, you'd have probably a higher quality of information, but you'd also have much less information and you'd miss some very crucial information. So it's not, it, it's certainly not a good thing, but it's not a disaster. Interesting stuff. Nick Thompson for us, a senior editor at Wired Magazine. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, Karen. You know, I've never understood, I mean, unless they're in some, you know, political hotspot like Iran, why bloggers are afraid to blog under their real name. Why they want to hide behind that veil of anonymity. If you get, well, so they can be really mean. If you've got an opinion, <laughs> times. put your name to it. Well, what if you want to Man say, up. What if you worry that you're going to be fired? I mean, this, it, let's say you want to expose corruption in your police department, and you know that if you put your name next to it, you're going to be fired or worse. Well, I mean, that's, 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 that's a fine case. You know, the majority of the blogs, though, they just want to be anonymous and say things about everybody. So That's true. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Nick.